Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 29. In this lecture, we'll discuss multi-element optical systems. This topic is covered in Chapter 36 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. In previous lectures, we've discussed the optics of mirrors and lenses. However, all the examples that we considered always consisted of only one optical element. In other words, we always considered the image that is formed by only one lens or one mirror. In this lecture, we want to discuss the optics of multi-element systems. We want to know what happens when there are two or three or four lenses or a combination of lenses and mirrors in the same optical system. After all, most interesting optical systems like microscopes, telescopes, and cameras really do have more than just one lens or more than one mirror. It turns out you already know everything you need to know for handling multi-element systems. The trick is essentially to treat each element of the system individually and treat the image of each element as the object of the next element in series. More precisely, this is what I mean. Suppose you have three lenses and you've placed an object in front of the first lens. We know that light is going to emanate from the object and some of that light is going to pass through lens one and then eventually it's going to pass through lens two and then eventually some of that light will pass through lens three and then finally we'll have an image somewhere and that will be the image that we'll capture on uh, let's say a piece of film or a CCD in a digital camera or something of that sort. So now the question is, given this particular object and this sequence of optical elements, where will the image form? Where will the final image form? And then what will be its size? Will it be upright? Will it be inverted, etc.? To answer a question like that, we start with lens one. So we completely ignore the other two lenses. And what we do is we calculate the image location just for lens one using the equations that we've gotten. So if the first element happens to be a thin lens, then we'll use the thin lens equation. If it happens to be a mirror, then we'll just use the mirror equation. But one way or another, the first element will give us an image and suppose that we figure out the image is here. This thing here is now labeled as I sub one, as in the image of element one. And now we're going to treat this as the object for element two. That's why I've labeled the same image as O2. So this image now becomes the object for element two and element two, in this case, the second lens, will now create another image of this object here. Once again, you use the mirror formula or the thin lens formula, and you find where the location of the image for lens two is. Suppose after you do the calculation, you find that we have an image, let's say, located over here. We're going to now view this as image for lens two, but also at the same time, we're going to treat it as the object for lens three. Now we're going to forget about the other two lenses. Again, just concentrate on the third element. Use the necessary equations to find out where the image for lens three will be. And once we've calculated the image for lens three, we're basically done with the problem. So lens three will essentially, quote unquote, see this thing as its object and it will create an image of this object over here. This thing, I3, will be the final image in this sequence of optical elements. So following this procedure, you can deal with 700 lenses and 200 mirrors all combined in series if you wanted to. In fact, you could probably write a computer program that would perform those kinds of calculations pretty quickly. It's all a matter of just repeating the same set of equations over and over again for each optical element. The important fact is that you treat the image for one optical element as the object for the next optical element. So you might be wondering how the procedure that I just outlined for you 
um, really works in terms of the actual rays of light that are refracting through lenses or reflecting from mirrors. Here I'm using an optical simulation to simulate um, two lenses in series. In this simulation, um, lenses are represented by vertical lines that have little arrows on the top and bottom. I also have a light source on the left extreme of this picture. You can imagine this point here being, uh, for example, the tip of a candle, but really this could be any point on a particular object. So we've placed an object on the left and we want to know where the image of that object will be. And for now, we're just considering a single point on that object. As you can see, light rays are emanating from the object going in every direction. Most of those light rays will just go into space, but some will strike the first lens located at approximately 300 millimeters from the object. The rays that strike the first lens, of course, are going to be refracted according to uh, the law of refraction, and eventually they'll emerge on the other side. As you can see, these rays are converging to a single point right over here. This is not necessarily the focal point. Remember, to find the focal point of a lens, you need horizontal beams of light incident on the lens from the left. That's not what we have here. What we see here is simply the image of this object. This is what we would call image one because it's the image formed by lens one. Image one then becomes object two or the object for lens two. Now notice that the rays of light don't really stop at this point. Remember that rays really represent wave fronts that are carrying energy and those wave fronts simply continue to propagate in space. Some of those rays will go into space and then some will actually strike the second lens. So it's not as if the rays somehow stop over here. They simply pass through this point. They are intersecting at that point. That intersection tells us that this is an important point, but otherwise the rays will continue going and some will strike the second lens and refract according to Snell's law from the second lens and then eventually emerge on the right side, again intersecting as at this special point. They could also continue moving past that special point. However, if you're trying to capture an image, then you need to place some kind of a light detector at this location. So for example, if this point here happens to coincide with the retina of your eye, then you would see a single bright spot and that would be the image associated with this object. On the other hand, if this happened to be a photographic film or the CCD inside a digital camera, then you would capture a single pixel of light that would be the image corresponding to this object over here. To calculate the location of this final image, you would basically apply the thin lens equation twice. The first time you apply it to this first lens and you would find the distance from the lens to this first image. And then that becomes the object for the second lens. You apply the thin lens equation again and you'll finally get the distance from the second lens to this final image. Here is another example. In this case, we have three lenses. These happen to be three converging lenses. And once again, the object is on the left. We're considering only one point on the object. So this green dot is supposed to represent, let's say the tip of a candle. And light is emanating in every direction. If this is not a candle, if it's something like a flower, then you have to assume that there's some kind of a light source, like an overhead light bulb, that is illuminating the tip of that flower and then light is reflecting in every direction from the flower. Some of the light will pass through the first lens. That light is um, converging to a single point over here. We can say this is the image of the object, not the final image, but maybe image one, as in the image formed by the first lens. But of course the rays don't stop there. They continue to move along a straight line 
until they reach the second lens. When they reach the second lens, they'll refract again and they'll emerge from the other side of the lens, again forming an image here. In this case, this point would be I2, as in image for lens 2, and then the image for lens 2 becomes the object for lens 3. The rays simply continue going along a straight line until they hit the third lens, then they'll bend again, they'll refract again, and finally we'll have an image formed over here at approximately 900 millimeters. If there is nothing physical there, then the rays will continue to move on, but if that happens to be your digital camera there, then you'll capture an image of this object over here at approximately 900 millimeters. To calculate that number, you would basically use the thin lens formula three times once for each one of these lenses. Of course, for each lens, you would have to be given the focal length, but given the focal length for each lens, you should be able to repeat that calculation three times to arrive at this final location. Here's one last example. In this example, I'm combining a converging lens with a concave mirror. So in the simulation that I'm using, this first vertical line represents a converging lens, and this second vertical line represents a concave mirror. Here, because of the reflection, the situation is a little more complicated. Once again, I have an object on the left, so the green dot represents a single point of some arbitrary object. Light is emanating in every direction. Some of that light will hit the first lens and it will refract. It will form an image and that image is formed right here. The rays, of course, continue to move forward along a straight line until they strike the mirror. When they strike the mirror, of course, they reflect according to the law of reflection. And in this case, they are all converging at this point over here, but they don't stop there. They'll simply continue moving along a straight line, but now they're going to go through the first lens one more time. So the reflection basically means that light passes through the lens once from left to right, and then again from right to left. That second time, as they're traveling from right to left, they converge at this location, and we can say this is the final image location. So now you can place a camera there and take a picture of the object at this location. Naturally, we want to be able to perform precise calculations for multi-element systems. So let's do a couple of practice problems just to make sure you're comfortable with this process. Calculate the final image location and magnification for the system shown below. So here our optical system consists of two lenses. They're both converging lenses. You can tell because each lens is thicker in the middle than it is on the edges. You can also tell because the focal lengths are positive. Remember that converging lenses have positive focal lengths, diverging lenses have negative focal lengths. We also have an object to the left. We want to know where the final image of this object will be. The object is located at x equals zero. The first lens is six centimeters away at x equals six. And the second lens is at x equals 15. To find out where the image formed by the first lens is going to be, we're basically going to ignore the second lens altogether. We'll just concentrate on the first lens and we'll use the thin lens equation, which says 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. We'll use this equation to figure out the image location for lens 1. Notice that in this picture, this distance here is going to be the object location. We'll call that P1. P1 is the object location for lens 1. If the object is at x equals 0 and the lens is at x equals 6, then we can say P1 is equal to 6. F1, of course, is given to us as 3, so we can plug those numbers in here and find what Q1 is. We can find out where the image formed by lens 1 is going to be. When we plug those numbers in, we find that Q1 
equals 6. What this tells us is that the image formed by lens 1 will be at x equals 12. So the lens is already at 6 centimeters, and it's going to create an image that is 6 centimeters further away, so its x-coordinate will be 12. What that means is that the image is going to form somewhere over here. This distance here would be 6. How did I know that the image is going to be upside down? For that, I had to look at the magnification. Recall that magnification is minus Q over P. If you want to calculate the magnification of lens 1 only, then you should be using Q1 and P1. We calculated Q1 to be 6, P1 is also 6, so the magnification for lens 1 ends up being minus 1. The minus sign tells us that the image is going to be inverted, and the 1 tells us that the image is going to be the same size as the object. We're now done with lens 1, so we can start analyzing lens 2. At this point, you can basically forget about lens 1. The light has already passed through lens 1, and now we want to know where the image formed by lens 2 will be. The image for lens 1 will become the object for lens 2. So this distance here, we'll call that P2, as in the object distance for lens 2. Since this is at 12 centimeters and the lens is at 15, we can say P2 is equal to 3. We have P2, and of course F2 is given to us as 2, so we can now calculate Q2. We're going to use the thin lens formula one more time, and we find, after plugging in the numbers, that Q2 is equal to 6 again. Recall that P and Q, the object distance and the image distance, are always calculated or measured relative to the lens. So if I'm talking about lens 2, this 6 tells me that the image of lens 2 will be 6 centimeters away from lens 2. What that means is that the x-coordinate for that image will be 21. The lens is already located at 15. 15 plus 6 gives me 21. That tells me that the final image, or the image um, after lens 2, will be located over here. How did I know that it's uh, upright? Well, I calculated the magnification for lens 2. I'm using the same formula, minus Q over P, but this time I'm substituting Q2, which is 6, and P2, which is 3, and I find that the magnification for lens 2 will be minus 2. The minus tells me that the image for lens 2 will be inverted relative to its object. The object was already upside down, so now it's going to be upright, and it's going to be twice as big. You might be interested in comparing the final, final image to the initial, initial object. For that, you need the magnification of the whole system. It turns out magnification of the entire optical system is simply the magnification of the first lens times the magnification of the second lens. In this case, minus 1 times minus 2 gives us 2. This magnification tells me that the very final image is going to be upright and it's going to be twice as big as the very first object. If we had 18 lenses lined up, we would calculate the magnification for each lens and then we would multiply them together. Notice that combining magnifications is done by multiplying them together, not adding them together. Let's do another practice problem with a two-element system. This one is a little more challenging. Calculate the final image location and magnification for the system shown below. So very much like the previous practice problem, we have two converging lenses. The focal lengths are given to us. The object, as usual, is located on the left. Light is going to propagate from left to right, pass through these lenses, and form a final image somewhere. We'd like to know where that image is going to be. Notice that what's different about this practice problem compared to the previous one is that the two lenses are much closer to each other. As usual, we're going to ignore the second one, concentrate on the first one, and first figure out where the image of the first lens is going to be. 
looking at the picture, I can see that the distance from the object to the first lens is going to be 6. So that'll be P1 is equal to 6. F1, of course, is given to us as 3. We can plug that information into the thin lens equation and find that Q1 is equal to 6. What that means is that the image for lens 1 will be 6 centimeters away from lens 1. It's positive six, so the um, image will be to the right or on the back side of lens one. Now, what does that mean six centimeters away? Well, that means that you have to start from the lens and move six centimeters to x equals 12 to arrive at the location of the first image. Now that we've figured out what lens one is doing, we can finally turn to lens two. Now notice something kind of strange. The image for lens 1, which becomes the object for lens 2, is already on the back side of the lens. Notice that for uh, these particular lenses, we speak about the front side and the back side. For lens 1, this is the front side where the light begins, and this is the back side. Of course, light continues to propagate from left to right, for the second lens, this is the front side and this is the back side. What's important here is that the image for lens 1, which becomes the object for lens 2, is already on the back side. What this means is that the image distance, or the object distance, I should say, is going to be not 3 centimeters, but minus 3 centimeters. So here, P2, the object distance for lens 2, is going to be a negative number, indicating that the object is not in front as it usually is, but rather in the back. Other than that one important fact, the rest of the calculation is quite trivial. Once again, you're going to use the thin lens formula. P2 is minus 3, F2 is 2, you plug those numbers in and you find that Q2 is 1.2. It's positive 1.2. That tells you that the image is formed on the back side, 1.2 centimeters away from lens 2. So its location will be at 10.2. So the lens is already at 9 centimeters. And if you go 1.2 centimeters further, you'll end up at 10.2. So the final image, the image formed by lens 2, is going to be located here. How did I know about its size and its orientation? Well, I figured out the magnification. The magnification for lens 1 was minus 1. Magnification for lens 2 is 0 0.4. And the magnification for the whole system is minus 0.4. What that means is that the final, final image is going to be inverted relative to the object. That's what the minus sign is telling me. And also, it's going to be smaller. So it will be 40% the size of the original object. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.